five uh, now, just five seconds. Mm -hmm. I think it's on YouTube, Jacopo, as I see. Mm, yeah, it's more, my page is uh, still uh, uploading. Uh, now, just five seconds. Yes, here we are. Okay. All right, so in the in the chat, I post also the YouTube link for the live streaming. Uh, we can start. So before the very first thing, I will ask everyone uh, if uh, if everyone is okay by being recorded, like this session will be recorded for dissemination purposes. So is everyone fine with that? Okay, okay, thank you very much. And. Um, then uh, we, we can start. It's a great pleasure today to, to be here for this uh, third roundtable session of uh, Away From Home. This is uh, a project that uh, we develop in a partnership between uh, uh, Sustainable Cooperation for Peace and Security and uh, from Italy and System and Generation Association from Turkey. So we developed this project to, to have a better understanding and overview on the phenomenon of migration and refugees. And um, today, especially, we will focus on climate refugees is a, a new emergent phenomenon. So uh, we have so many experts uh, as guest speakers today that will help us understand more on this new phenomenon. Uh, it's my great pleasure to, to have all of you here and many uh, followers that will, uh, will follow this uh, session in live streaming. Uh, I will thank you, Marius, the representatives of our partner organization. Marius, maybe can I start with you if you would like to, to introduce yourself and, and give the floor to, to our participants as well. Thank you very much, uh, Jacopo. As Jacopo said, I'm president of Sustainable Cooperation for Peace and Security. It's an Italian-based uh, organization. We started this co collaboration with uh, System and Generation, that is the head of the Annalyn Foundation Turkey. And uh, we together collaborated, uh, creating three conferences on the topic of refugees on different level. First of all, on a legal framework, and second, like on the uh, on a city level between Mantua and uh, and Ankara. And the third one is uh, introducing this new uh, concept of uh, climate refugees. Um, after this, we are going also to produce a guide, a project guide about uh, about the issue of refugees in the Euro Mediterranean region. Um, as I said, we are supposed to have five uh, speakers today, but Andrea is having an issue. He's still, uh, he's still uh, working, and uh, when she will finish, she will join as soon as she can. So I don't know how long it, uh, it will take. Um, today we have two academics and two uh, practitioners, civil society activists. Um, as uh, I have the pleasure to introduce here, uh, here Dr. Sara uh, Nash uh, from Austria, if I'm not wrong. Um, and uh, Dr. Harald Sterli from Austria as well. Um, then we have um, uh, Mrs. Shradha Nair, let me know if I spelled it uh, right, from UK, and uh, Mr. Ahmed Yassin from Egypt. Um, as I introduce, would you like to take a bit the mic so we can test the audio and then um, I will just uh, uh, tell the speakers the order. Is that fine? Can you say a few words? Yep, uh, I guess we'll just go with the order you introduced us in. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you for the invitation to be here today. I'm Sarah Nash. I'm a political scientist working at the University of Natural Resources and Life Sciences in Austria. I'm originally from Scotland. Um, and my research is on the politics and policy surrounding climate change and migration. Yeah, hello. Thanks a lot. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, my name is Harold. I'm from... Uh, originally from Germany, um, now with the University of Vienna. I'm a geographer working on um, mostly adaptation um, to climate change and how migration can contribute to the adaptation to climate change. Uh, thanks, Marius, for introducing us. 
I'm Shraddha Nair. Uh, I'm originally from India, but I'm currently in Glasgow. Uh, and um, I am, right now I'm doing my master's at University of Strathclyde. So a research uh, approach to master's, I can say. In, uh, we are focused on economics and policy of energy and climate change. And uh, my area of uh, interest is uh, environmental economics. And I'm also currently working as a green growth strategist for um, a company in California. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you so, mu uh, so much, Marius, for the invitation. Uh, my name is Ahmed Yassin, the co-founder of Benlastic Egypt, and Benlastic is aimed to ban the single-use plastic in Egypt and around the Mediterranean region uh, by working on uh, the green services and offering alternatives to the single-use plastic, a green consultancy, and also connecting with the decision makers uh, especially in Egypt, to support the system that can ban the single-use plastic and promote for uh, better solutions. Also, I'm a solar engineer who works and advocates for uh, the uh, renewable energy as a better resource than a fossil fuel. And um, I'm currently, I'm working on preparing for the COP27 Climate Task Force uh, as the youth part, and we're trying to connect with um, the uh, uh, the uh, uh, the uh, syndicate who are responsible for that, just to support and to implement the project. Ahmed, you look like you are a quiet. Uh, how can I say? Uh, active activist, sorry for the playing with uh, with these words. We met also the royals I saw like a few weeks ago in uh, in Egypt, and uh, and uh, what I saw when they posted like and they said it's the first time the photographer said it's the first time that they see like a royal drinking from from like a plus not not well, how was it like a paper, a, cup. A paper <laughs> cup. How, how, how did it make you feel? It's, it's a really lovely moment, especially that they've been speaking about how uh, the, you know, uh, the, one of the uh, most famous royal families around the world are monarchies, but they are surprised that Egypt is um, doing so and they have those initiatives because uh, people sometimes uh, have a sort of a stereotype about uh, you know the African southern part of, uh, or the the North Africa or southern part of, uh, uh, you know the Med is not really active and just people who uh, are not really thinking about the future of the climate. But that was really surprisingly lovely that they found out that there is something, there is some um, sort of, you know, <clears throat> work and activism regarding the climate. He also insisted that he've spoken about the plastic in the seventies, Prince. Uh, Prince of Wales, Prince Charles. <laughs> yeah, sorry, I did not mention it was Prince Charles and, uh, and Camilla, uh, and Princess Camilla. <laughs> that, that was amazing, Ahmed, to see like uh, you are such a successful activist uh, in Egypt and you are already working for COP27. That's, uh, that's amazing. Um, so uh, before uh, we will have the time to deepen uh, our thoughts about uh, about these kind of meetings and activities that our uh, speakers are doing, I would like to give the floor to Dr. Nash and Dr. Sterling. That I'm not sure how they are divided, but uh, what I know is that they are they will uh, set up the scene about uh, about the climate refugees. So they will tackle the, the issue in uh, in big. But uh, I don't know how they are divided because I know that they work like uh, in the background for it. And then um, Mrs. Shadra Nair will talk a bit about the economic consequences on uh, uh, that uh, that um, climate change is having like on, uh, on people and uh, and we'll tackle more the economic side. And then we'll give the we'll come back with Ahmed uh, again and to going a bit deeper like on the activities that he's doing uh, um, in person in Egypt. Um, so, Dr. Nash and Dr. Sterling, whenever you are ready, you can <laughs> you can go ahead. Yeah, thanks a lot, uh, Mrs. Feli. I think yeah, we are uh, as as you already said, um, we prepared a bit. We prepared even a PowerPoint, as <laughs> as we are teachers. Maybe that's that's in our uh, DNA. I don't know. I hope it's. Uh, we try to keep it brief and short, and um, um, I think we will be able to give you a, a good overview of um, current topics and uh, ideas and the key angles um, that we think are important when we talk about climate migration, climate mobility, climate refugees. Um, is it okay when I, when I share the screen? Okay, I just give it a try, what happens? 
ah, that looks good. Okay, perfect. So we we uh, we, we want to give you an overview of, let's say, six six dimensions or angles or aspects that we think are important when we talk about um, climate change and migration. Um, and these things are, um, I will I will start by giving a brief introduction and right through the key terms and concepts. So what are we talking about if we talk about climate change and migration? Um, and as you see, it's not easy, easy. So I will give you a brief, uh, like some ideas why this is not so easy and straightforward as it could be maybe, or as we as can could be assumed. Um, then I will give you a dip into the topic of adaptation. So what climate uh, change and migration um, have to do when we have the angle of climate change adaptation. And then um, uh, Dr. Nash will uh, go into deeper into the topic of climate refugees about this. Um, uh, I, it's, it's a kind of a, a, um, a difficult field, the numbers, because that's something where everybody wants, why well, you, you, you want to hear numbers. Um, and we would be having a bit of a critical approach uh, towards these numbers. And of course, on the different perspectives that are relevant here in media and, and uh, representation. Sarah, I hope that was correct. Um, so I just give it a start, terms and concepts. Uh, what and who are we talking about? Um, a couple of years ago, we prepared this figure. I just updated the numbers. Um, if you type these terms, and there are many more linked to the relationship between environmental change slash climate change or environment and climate, and in the more broadest sense, maybe mobile or not so mobile people. Um, out of them, climate refugees is obviously the most popular one. It has the highest uh, number of, of uh, at least what Google, Google thinks it's the most popular one. Um, but they, basically that reflects also how many people or how many, how many pages and how many entries have been created about this topic. So the big ones are environmental and climate refugees. These are two very important things uh, that are being always popping up if you look for the relations between environmental change and, um, and mobility. And then there are all, I, I put them in red because it's, the, you will see also, Sarah will, will um, go deeper into this, that it's not easy to speak about these terms and uh, as at least social scientists and uh, migration researchers would be a bit careful or very careful of uh, talking about climate refugees and certainly use these terms only in very um, uh, special situations or with a special sense of meaning. The broader term that I think is more appropriate if we talk about the phenomenon of people moving in relation to environment or environmental change is environmental migration. Um, there's a definition that the International Organization for Migration has put out, I think also about 10 years ago, um, that is very broad. It, it's, very, it's basically um, saying people are considered environmental migrants um, if they move more um, um, voluntary or less voluntary um, due to any reasons that have to do with environmental or climate change. Um, so where more or less environment is the reason for migration and where this migration or movement is more or less um, voluntary. Um, linked to that, of course, climate migration or the term environmental migrants, but also environmental induced migration. Now you can see it goes a bit more carefully in, a, in, a, in an indirect way. So this, is, would be, this would be denoting migration that's not environmentally, but that's induced somehow that has to do with, uh, um, with environmental factors or change. Um, same with in climate change induced migration or eco migration would be another term. Um, if you look around, they, you could probably populate this list uh, even more. Then there's the whole bunch of displacement, which is a specific term, um, uh, people displaced, and this would be a more clear-cut case of attribution. If people are displaced by environmental hazards or events, this is mostly easier to, to delineate. So like, okay, that we can say um, when people are displaced by um, either geophysical events like earthquakes or hazards, but we are now talking more about climate things. So storms, um, landslides, uh, mud flows, etc. cetera. Um, and then we have terms uh, that denote people who cannot move or whose mobility is maybe restricted or confined 
through environmental factors of change. Um, one popular term here is trapped populations, people who would like to move away because there are environmental risk or hazard or other reasons that um, make them um, motivating to move, but they cannot because of uh, affordability or because of social restrictions uh, whatsoever. Um, and rather new one would be environmental non-migration. So people who decide to not migrate um, due to whatever reasons are related to environment. So what you see here, it's, there's a, a whole universe of, of, uh, of, of, of concepts, ideas, of notions and definitions. And that doesn't make it really easy to deal with the topic because what we cannot clearly name, we cannot really easily count. We need to be very careful about what we are talking about uh, specific. Um, what these things have to do all in common, they relate somehow to environment or to climate or to environmental and climate change. Um, if you go into detail, it would be also important to, to make clear delineations here. What are we talking about? And the mobility part. So this would be the part why people move and then how people move or are mobile or not mobile, the mobility part. Um, and this ranges from immobility or non-migration, uh, what could be voluntary or involuntary, um, spanning a full range of different degrees of voluntariness of migration uh, to displacement or, uh, and I put this in parentheses, refugees on the other side, so the non-voluntary. So there's a whole range of, of topics that we need to be aware. Um, so why is that so, or complicated or so complex? Well, the easy and short answer is uh, we have really, really in the best sense of the word, complex relations here. There are very rarely simple, I could put it no, but very rarely simple cause effect relations. Uh, tropical cyclone hits and people get displaced. That would be a quite an, a simple cause effect relations, but people move back and some, some people who move back uh, um, restart building livelihoods. Um, others cannot move because their areas are declared uh, um, danger zones. So what is that now? That people cannot move back because of declaration of, of, uh, of uh, certain zones um, denies them from, from coming back. Is that then climate change or climate event related displacement? Or is this a kind of resettlement that is linked directly to an event? You see where, where I'm up to. Um, we, we very rarely have climate change or climate events directly impacting on migration. What we have is clearly uh, a vast array of impacts of climate uh, factors and climate change on ecological systems, on social systems, on economic systems, political systems, um, on different processes, conflicts, whatever. And these then um, relate to people's decisions to migrate or people's uh, um, um, people's displacement. So in very rare occasions, we have very clear cut uh, causal relations in most cases, and we have them, yes, but in most cases uh, where people decide that one person of the household needs to move because uh, harvests are, are no more providing enough or sufficient uh, nutrition for the household or um, a combination of, of um, insecurity of rainfall or increasing variability of rainfall, and um, decreasing or um, worsening terms of trade for agricultural uh, livelihoods in combination mean that one person moves to the city to get additional income. So then you can see that these systems are interacting, um, they are impacting on each other. Climate change is impacting on the overall setup of these systems. In many cases, or in most cases, climate change acts as a kind of risk multiplier. It increases pressures and risks, but the relationship is not easy. And that's, uh, um, I think Sarah will, will, will come also again to this point. Like that's one reason why it is not easy to come up with clear numbers and say so like, well, we can calculate uh, and very simply model how many people might be or will be displaced or migrate, decide to migrate uh, in uh, this and this amount of time due to climate reasons. Um, so what about, uh, adaptation, can uh, migration also be helpful? And that's a, that's a very specific own discourse or, or um, debate inside the whole area of climate change and migration. There's the big field of how does climate impact people's movements? But there's also the other angle, how does people's movement and migration impact their ability to deal with climate change? So as I said, it's 
it, this is not an easy thing. And what we observe is, of course, that whole households and communities shift and are displaced. But what we observe much more often is that it's not whole households or whole communities, but it's individuals who migrate in order to support uh, households and place of origin for difficulties coming from climate change or uh, in any other means. So in many cases, migration is linked to the idea of supporting households at the places of origin. And then this interacts with the ability of households to adapt to climate change. So, and what we clearly can see from, from research that yes, migration can indeed help households to cope, to, uh, cope with and adapt to, to climate change, but this, this happens under certain conditions. Not all migration helps people. Um, um, and not all helps the migrant, not all migration ends up with migrants being in a better situation, neither with the households at uh, places of origin being in, in a better situation. So under certain conditions that tends to work out better uh, and under conditions not. Um, we generally see that my, the mechanism that's behind here is clearly um, through migration, people diversify their, their, their income uh, by sectors and by, by place, of course, if people from um, small scale agricultural livelihoods move away to cities and, and work in industry or services. Of course, there's a sectoral diversification that helps if uh, um, climate related um, um, harvest or agriculture losses uh, um, take place in rural areas. This can be um, compensated through, through income from other sectors and income in other places. Um, so we have risk and income diversification. That's the key mechanism here behind. Um, so what we can see is that uh, through domestic and international migration, that's one thing um, I want to emphasize here that we are not talking only of international migration when it comes to, to migration and uh, environmental change, but also um, especially domestic migration, because that's what's easier. That's what's uh, creating less cost for, for people to move to the near areas to um, generate income than to move internationally. But both of them, domestic and international migration, creates networks between people at destination and at origin. Um, and these networks um, and bonds, they facilitate flows of, of course, financial remittances. That's the most prominent one, but also um, ideas, knowledge, skills, um, ambitions, worldviews, et cetera. PP. So there, there's lots of things happening after migration. So for us, migration is the starting point, And we see, okay, what happens there? after that. Oh, now that's just two uh, illustrations. Uh, international remittances uh, versus in blue versus the official development aid in orange. Okay, I've, I'm through with my part. Now uh, I stopped talking because I talked already too long. Now it's Sarah's turn. Okay, thank you so much, Hawaz. Uh, if you're so kind as to keep um, controlling the slides as well, we can um, move on quicker. Um, so the first question I'm going to answer is probably the question that I get asked the most frequently when I talk about my work in public settings, and that is, do climate refugees exist? Um, and here I'm going to be kind of this really annoying academic, and I'm going to give this answer that is, well, yes, and well, no. Um, you know, as, as Harold has already explained, people are going to be displaced, people are going to choose to move due to climate impacts, or in the context of climate impacts. Um, and that is also a position that I hold. Um, you know, I recognise the kind of the structural violences, the negative impacts of climate change, what these can cause, the impacts they can have on the very foundations of people's lives. So this is not denying climate change and its impact. Nevertheless, I believe that there's an argument to be made for avoiding the terminology of climate refugees when talking about these issues. Um, and I'm briefly going to sketch three reasons um, why this is the case. Um, and if we can move on to the, the next slide. Um, the first reason is that the term is just legally spurious. Um, the Geneva Refugee Convention from 1951 defines exactly the criteria really, really specifically for being a refugee. A person has to have fled across international borders uh, due to persecution or fear of persecution because they are a certain race, religion, nationality, a certain political opinions or part of a particular social group. So climate change impacts or even environmental conditions are not one of the criteria recognised according to this current law. Um, now, just because something is not contained in a current law doesn't necessarily mean that it shouldn't be, right? So alone, this isn't, for me, enough reason to not use climate refugees. Um, 
So on the basis of the Geneva Refugee Convention alone, I would not necessarily be making this argument that I'm making now. But I'm also of the firm belief that using the term climate refugees also puts existing refugee protections in danger. Um, because if one argues that climate refugees should be legally protected in this kind of mechanism, it's then very often argued that this should be addressed by opening up the Refugee Convention, right? Um, however, I am genuinely really quite worried that if the Refugee Convention were opened up for amendments, for changes um, today in our, in our current political world, um, that this would mean that states use it as an opportunity to water down existing protections, um, to delete things they don't like in the Refugee Convention, as it were. Um, now, this isn't to say that existing protections are perfect, right? We all know that pitfalls and problems with the Refugee Convention with refugee protection worldwide but they do provide some good protections to a very specific group of people who undoubtedly need them. Um, and for me, it would be ethically really quite problematic to consider putting these people at even more risk by putting in danger protections that they rely on. Um, so for me, that's why I wouldn't want to open up the Refugee Convention. And the third reason, um, which is on my next slide, um, and actually is for me the most important reason, um, it moves beyond these kind of legalese and policy arguments. And it's that people who are potentially going to be displaced by climate change impacts in the future, um, specifically from small island developing states in the Pacific, have argued that they are not climate refugees and that they don't want to be to ref referred to using this term. Um, this for me alone is reason not to be using it. You know, any justice based approach listens to the affected or potentially affected people um, and has their um, opinions in the foreground. And their arguments are twofold. One is that their governments didn't actually cause climate change. So if they are forced to flee, they're not fleeing from their governments. Um, they're not fleeing from their home states because of actions that their state has committed. Um, actually, they very much want to stay there. Um, the second part of this argument um, is that people don't want to be perceived as victims, um, but rather as people with agency who want to stay in their homes. Um, so these are arguments that have, you know, have come from affected or potentially affected communities, and for me, are the basis of why I don't use the climate refugee term. Okay, so that's kind of the terminology question, uh, and very linked to this, obviously, then, is the, the second question that I get asked almost as frequently, which is, well, how many climate refugees will there be then? Um, and Harold has already touched on why this is just so very, very difficult to answer. Um, and actually, we, we've written an opinion piece um, in an Austrian newspaper last year about this very number um, you can see on the screen right now. Because although this is quite an unusual step for an academic to take, right, writing a, a newspaper article about uh, ranting about a number that's in a, a policy report, um, I personally was, was quite frustrated and annoyed about it being reproduced over and over again. Um, so yeah, that's, that's why we um, outed ourselves uh, against uh, these numbers. Um, and if on the next slide, we can see a selection of numbers that have been passed around um, oh, um, in, the, in the climate and migration field. Oh, yeah, if you can put up all of those, thank you. Um, the first one um, is this estimate that was on the previous slide of up to 1.2 billion climate refugees by 2050. This came from the Institute for Economics and Peace. Um, this is probably the most untenable of the uh, estimates that's currently out there. I'm sure someone will top it at some point. Um, but at the moment, it's, it's the kind of most problematic one out there. Um, it was arrived at by simply adding together the numbers of people um, being newly displaced um, and then um, extrapolating this into a trend of continual upward growth. So it was actually only possible for this line to keep exponentially growing until 2050. Um, it's complete fiction, um, and I would really call on everyone not to use this particular number. Um, even if you are using numbers, even if you are wanting to work with projections, please not this one. Um, the second figure here um, that's been doing the rounds since about 2002 um, is between 150 and 200 million people. Um, an estimate generated by the environmental scientist Norman Myers. His estimate was slightly better in that there was a method behind it. Um, it looked at the areas of the world that would be most impacted by climate change um, and, and climate impacts. 
I calculated the number of people living there. Um, so it's a very, very rough estimate, but it was based on climate impact and potential climate impact. The third um, of the, the figures here, um, which is for 216 million internal climate migrants in 2050, it's a World Bank figure, um, is based on quite sound modelling. Um, however, it doesn't take into account factors such as adaptation to climate change, social factors, political factors, that as um, we heard in the previous part of the presentation, we know also have huge impacts of whether people choose to migrate, are forced um, to move, or whether they, they choose to stay. Um, so again, the models um, were pretty sound, but obviously some factors missing here. And the final figure here um, is the one that if I'm forced to use a figure I tend to turn to, um, it's from the Internal Displacement Monitoring Center, Monitoring Center who are very reliable, um, partly because they are talking about current numbers, right? So they can really look at what's happening and really um, work from the all aspects of people's realities um, and how they interact with, with climate impact. Um, however, they only focus on newly displaced people and not people in protracted uh, displacement situations. So there's, again, some aspects missing here, um, but probably one of the, the most um, reliable ones to turn to. Um, and then to move on um, to the final question that I um, posed myself to answer today. Um, how are people displaced in the context of climate change talked about? Um, how are doc newspapers, documentaries reporting these issues? Um, and of course, these are connected to the numbering and terminology debates, right? If we're using huge um, over the top numbers, if we're using terminology that's a bit wobbly, of course, the reporting is also going to reflect these things. So they're all hugely interconnected. Um, but what I'd just like to do is kind of order, uh, put in a little bit of a word of caution, if you like, on how reporting on these issues is done um, and highlight three separate trends that kind of concern me. Um, the first is that the potential scale of the situation in particular the potential impacts this could have for the global north are emphasised over and over again, um, rather than the impacts on people's lives um, who are living with climate impacts. So that would be the first of these trends. The second one um, on the next slide is the wide usage of hydrological metaphors, water-based metaphors, to refer to people being displaced by climate. So words like wave, flood, I've even seen the word tsunami, used to speak about the people who are moving, not the impacts that are causing them to move. So again, it's making the people moving the threat rather than the focus being on um, the negative sides of the impact. And the third of these tendencies, which is on my final side, um, and two stills from the documentary Climate Refugees. Um, the first on the left is what I like to call big scary red arrows. Um, we see this a lot in documentaries and policy reports, and it tends to be big red arrows pointing towards um, a state in the global north. Um, again, giving this picture that all of these people are going to be coming here and it's a really big scary thing. Um, and the other image um, is a very militarised picture, uh, both combining to securitise people on the move and you know make people scared of people moving rather than scared of climate impacts. And I think this is concerning. Um, so to kind of sum up our arguments um, on, you know, why do these questions matter? Why have we pulled all these critical um, strands together? Well, it's not just because we're, you know, pedantic academics, although I would argue that I, I probably am. Um, it's because that false perceptions of climate change and displacement or migration can lead to fundamentally flawed policy responses. Um, if people in the global north are made to feel frightened about climate refugees, about huge numbers of people potentially fleeing their homes, then the reaction is not most likely going to be climate action, as it should be. It's not most likely to be safe and legal routes for refugees and migrants, as it should be, um, but maybe increasing border so controls, securitization, militarization, Frontex, um, campaigns trying to persuade people not to start migration journeys, all of these things. Um, and this will be fundamentally bad for both climate and mobility justice. So that's you know, why we've been making these arguments today. And I hope we can discuss them more in the, the Q&A afterwards. Thank you. 
that was a lot of food for thoughts. So now we have uh, we have really a general, not just a general overview, but also specific overview because we tackled everything about climate change refugees, like from the international perspective of the Geneva Convention or international organizations, internal displacement, and like the, the numbers also in general, not just internal, but also like between countries. So that was uh, that was uh, a lot uh, a lot of thoughts and uh, I I needed to take notes of the truth so because it was really important. Um, before moving to the next speaker, I would also give the floor. Uh, I would like to introduce also some of our youth that are with us today, but are following us like since uh, since the beginning. They are here uh, live and some of them are just following us from uh, from the YouTube channel. We have here Francesca. Um, Ezra, uh, Nelly, Bura, Noemi, and Zico. Uh, I would like to ask you if you would like to uh, introduce a bit yourself as, uh, as well and tell us a bit more if you have experience working or volunteering with refugees. Uh, I can start. Uh, I'm Ezra. I'm a local volunteer with uh, System and Generation. Uh, for my experience, uh, for now, uh, with System and Generation, we are working uh, with some refugees from uh, Syria. Like uh, all uh, Sundays, we are going to a refugee center to teach them English. And sometimes we are, uh, they are giving some feedback to us, like uh, our lives, our uh, whole stories. Sometimes we are organizing some sports events and they are joining us. Thank you. Francesca, can you go next? Yeah, uh, hi everyone. So yes, I'm Francesca I'm from Italy. Um, I follow the other, uh, the two previous sex, uh, sessions. And uh, uh, for this one, actually, uh, it's the first time that uh, I have uh, a deep, uh, overview on uh, uh, climate uh, ref the climate refugees and uh, maybe there, there will be time later for the questions um, but anyway really interesting and so I'm volunteering with uh, with SNG but we have like a uh, we work with uh, refugees the classic definition let's say uh, implementing different uh, activities um uh, as I already told uh something spoke about it. Um uh, let's see. Thank you. Hi, I'm from Spain. Um so actually uh, we are working with a uh, uh, Syrian family and also as uh, Francisca said, uh, we are also teaching uh, English uh, to uh, Syrian uh, uh, refugees and uh, the, for me, in my opinion, I can uh, face like uh, here in Turkey, uh, there is a big risk right now because of uh, the, I can feel that uh, Syrian uh, refugees are not uh, well integrated here and I really feel that there are a lot of Latins here and I don't know, like this, the more common situation, I can feel that right now, yes. Hi, uh, it's Mura. I am the general coordinator of the SNG. Actually, uh, on a management part, uh, we work with Tigo there. They are kind of a, a association of the uh, migrants, uh, teenagers, and uh, as an association, we teach them uh, some language as an EPSAT. And also, uh, each week, we are visiting the uh, Syrian family, and uh, Naomi and Igram, we are so helpful to them, I think, because we are trying to integrate all, actually, in our country. This is uh, all what I uh, said, actually. Thank you. Um, also, I can add that uh, I think the big barrier is about the language, but also the cultural uh, Turkish people uh, usually talk about the came from different culture and I can I don't know I think that the reference here is really increasing a lot um I think it's about social uh, barriers. barriers yes thank you 
Who's left? Nelly and Simone, are you here? We can hear you, but we can't see you. Yes. Hello. 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 Um, I'm Nelly from Italy. Me too. Okay. I'm Simone from Italy, yeah. Yeah. We're also volunteering with uh, SMG and yeah, they told everything. Yeah, they told them with... basically everything because they told about Syrian family, about the refugee center, center, and we do the same things. <laughs> <laughs> there is not, not yeah. so much more to, you know, to add. Yes, that, that, I mean, that's great. I appreciate your honesty. <laughs> I don't need to repeat things that were already said. It looks like in every screen there are like three, four people. Okay. Um, great. And I would like also to introduce Paul Krasnitzer that I forgot to introduce before. He's a member of our uh, organization, Sustainable Cooperation for Peace and Security. Um, Paul, would you like to say a few words? What are you doing on the field of sustainability? I know that you are doing a PhD also. Yes. Hello, I'm Paul. I'm from, also from Austria and I'm a quite new member of the NGO Sustainable Cooperation for Peace and Security. And I just started like two weeks ago a PhD position on a rather different subject because I'm doing like a ecological process assessment in a field of sustainability, but I have a personal interest in the topic, on the topic of climate refugees and generally refugees. That's why I'm here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Uh, before moving to Shraddha, I'll give the floor back to Jacopo, that is um, the lead of this, uh, the, the co-lead of this uh, project. Jacopo is project manager of Sustainable uh, of Systems and Generation Association from Turkey. He's Italian, but he's based in, uh, in Ankara. Jacopo, you can, uh, you can take the floor back and then please, you go ahead with the next speakers. Thank you very much. Yes, I'm actually now I'm in Italy, but uh, yeah, I work uh, with System and Generation. So as um, our youth said, we, we, were, we are pretty much active uh, in uh, supporting the refugee community in the city of Ankara. Um, before the pandemic, we were doing a lot, really a lot, like we were going in, into centers. There are many uh, refugees, mostly from Syria, but not only in, in Ankara. So we were doing many activities to, uh, to support them. And uh, it was very much uh, rewarding, I would say, for, for all of us. And after the pandemic, yeah, for a while we needed to stop, but now uh, we are very glad that we, we, we could restart some months ago to, uh, to work together and to, to do our best to, to work for the social inclusion of refugees as uh, in, uh, in Ankara and in Turkey, there is still a lot to do in this regard, like uh, generally, uh, refugees uh, in Turkey often they they can experience some episode of intolerance, uh, discrimination. So and mostly they are uh, quite marginalized uh, from the rest of the civil society. So it's important that there are uh, civil society organizations or governmental programs that uh, that work for uh, for the inclusion instead of of the refugee community. And yeah, that's pretty much all. Uh, I thank all our youth. I, I want to thank our first two speakers. Thank you very much for, for all your inputs. That will be very much useful also, as, uh, as Marius mentioned before, also in, in, in the next future, because from these uh, sessions, we will also uh, make a, a manual, an handbook for all the youth workers that uh, are currently working with, with refugees. So we want to um, to come out with um, contents and recommendations thanks to, to your session. So it will be pretty much useful also in the, in the future. Uh, so now we can uh, proceed with, uh, with Ms. Nahir, our uh, next expert uh, guest speaker. Thank you very much. I'll just quickly share my screen. So let me know if you can see the screen. Yes, we can. We can. Oh, great, thank you. Uh, so thank you so much uh, for having me here at this moment. I know I'm not as expert or much academic as uh, Sarah and um, our other expert here, 
but I'm just going to give you a just small overview on what being a youth, especially from what from my perspective, what do we mean by climate refugees? And since uh, my area of expertise is environmental economics, I'll just be giving an overview on how all this is having an economic impact because at the end of the day, it is not just about, you know, moving into a net transition or uh, let's say uh, moving into um, mitigation and adaptation of climate change and climate refugees. We also need to focus on the economics of everything uh, to keep the, you know, um, countries running. So um, I've just put up as case studies, but honestly, uh, I'm just going to, for uh, people who don't know the concept of um, climate refugees or how it is different from uh, normal refugees, it's just that um, basically climate refugees are, of course, uh, people who are being displaced from their um, habitats because of climate disasters. And as I've written here, mitigation and adaptation is the key to you know saving humanity uh, at the point from climate disasters, because uh, no matter whether the uh, developed countries are, you know, not keeping the emissions below uh, zero, below 1.5 degrees or somebody else is doing it, at the end of the day, everybody is getting, all the countries are equally getting affected. Climate disasters don't discriminate between developed and underdeveloping countries. And main three examples are Bangladesh, India, and now the United States as well. Uh, so, this is an example from uh, Rohingya. It's a place, small town in Bangladesh. And Bang since I'm from India and I know the all, in, entire Indian subcontinent is at a position where, you know, a lot of people are getting affected uh, because of the rising sea levels. And this was a huge fire that happened in the city of, in the small town of Rohingya. And about uh, 15 people died. It doesn't sound like a lot numbered, honestly, but humanity is humanity and um, about 10 10000 people were about uh, you know displaced from their uh, normal habitat because of forest fires this is a place in india called uh, gagalmari it's in the uh, it's a very small village in the state of assam and this happened in january 2021 so these are just very recent events that happened throughout this year uh, and um, this was a flash flood that happened in this particular uh, town. And this town is very much prone to, um, uh, you know, flash floods, uh, not just this town, other entire coastal area. In fact, India, countries like India, Bangladesh, um, some uh, Indonesia, Thailand, they are all uh, island, you know, um, countries. And um, especially for India, the entire uh, Malabar coast, the southern part and the eastern and the western part are entirely having um, coastal areas. So that is uh, very much vulnerable. And when why I mentioned US is even though we have countries like Brazil and Mexico and Chile and also, you know, um, China having a um, lot of issues who are having climate refugees. The main thing why I wanted to point out US is because, like I said, climate disasters don't uh, discriminate between which country it is. And um, this, uh, this is a place called uh, Louisiana State, if, every, if anybody's uh, familiar with it. In the state of uh, Louisiana, there's an isle. And this isle is basically like a small island. And it, there is only one main connection, as you can see here, to the mainland of the United States. And earlier, this was a huge uh, peat area and there were marshes. So people did not actually require roads to go uh, to get across to the mainland. But uh, because of the huge oil and gas industries, um, deforestation, and they were building pipelines to, you know, um, get the communities running, um, almost 95% uh, of the entire peatlands and marshlands have been destroyed. And this strip of land that you see is the only strip that is remaining that connects between this uh, US mainland and the um, small isle of the Louisiana state. And this is the first city uh, or town, I should say, that has been um, marked as a climate emergency and the first climate refugee alert city of the United States. Because as you can see, the sea levels are rising continuously and literally in another four or five years, this entire strip of land is going to go underwater and then there'll be no direction. So basically the entire people, all the people living in, on that isle will have to be displaced someplace. And like Sarah was mentioning, all the 
uh, you know, red uh, arrows are pointing towards North America. Everybody just cannot move to North America for some reason. Um, I think Sarah mentioned this uh, internal displacement monitoring center. This is a great um, uh, referen referral if anybody wants to go through details. And these are the five top countries uh, with the most new displacements as per the disasters. Most of them are flash floods. Um, and this is 2019 data, although, but this I think this stands true for 2020 and 2021 as well. India is definitely the highest because of its uh, geographical location. And um, I, I am I'm surprised to see that, uh, you know, we don't have a lot of countries from the uh, global south. And I'm, I am pretty impressed with the fact that how the geography is situated. Uh, but yes, India, Philippines, Bangladesh, and China are the top four. And of course, now United States because of the uh, forest fires happening, happening in California and um, states like Florida and uh, state, Louisiana State and everything is um, going through so much of changes in terms of rising sea levels. I think this is also applicable to the central belt. That's the Central America, uh, Ecuador and uh, Mexico. Uh, all these uh, countries are also facing a lot of uh, issues in terms of how this can be mitigated. Um, so this is um, a graph I happened to come across during research for this. And um, of course, the source is political and economical natural disaster damage. And uh, as you can see here, because we have to eventually talk about how all this is going to affect the economics, and uh, so yeah, this, from flash floods, as you can see, China and India having the highest uh, in the in the 1900s in the last 10 years, and again, China and India are still ranking on the top. And it's very surprising to see that you know China and India are like the countries with the highest population, and they are the ones definitely being affected. And uh, if I just move on here. Um, so from an economic standpoint of view, we are always doing cost benefit analysis, new projects coming in for people to be moved from one place to another because they are climate refugees. What are the costs that go into it? What are the benefits of moving these people from there? And uh, from an activist point of view, from, um, um, from a youth perspective, you know, the youth part of me dies when I say this. Uh, you have to actually calculate the benefit of what cost you're putting in. And that also somewhere makes the, you know, uh, makes activists say that that kills the humanity in you as well. But no, we have to, it's a slight balance, uh, thin rope on which we are actually, uh, you know, moving on here when you, when in terms of economic growth of any country. And I, I'm, okay, this graph is a little bit wrong here. So this should be discounted and this should be undiscounted. And uh, those who are new to the concept of economics, uh, so basically undiscounted is, let's say I have 100 rupees today or $100 today, 10 years later, it, the value of $100 will be, let's say $120. But when you are not discounting it, that still stays $100. So if I tell you, I'm gonna give you $100 today for a particular project to let's say for uh, displacing climate refugees from uh, Bangladesh to some other part of the world. Uh, but in, that's gonna take you five years more. And every year, if I'm giving you $100, the value of $100 will be increased uh, you know, in five years. So then, then $100 will not be useful. You will need more. So that is basically the difference between discounted and undiscounted. And from an economist uh, perspective, uh, we always calculate the discounted value because we need to know how much $100 is worth in five years or 10 years when we are actually implementing these projects. So what can be done? It's a great question. We all know we have activists here and we have youth here. We have people here who are working uh, diligently with you know different climate refugees across globe and Thanks to you, everyone. We are. I think we have we have people out there who are actually working for it. So three main things: definitely adapt, mitigate, and I have added economics in it because we need to uh, we need to keep that in mind. As Sarah was mentioning, mitigation is important, and of course, um, adaptation is a huge point. But it's not because climate change is un, in an, it's, it's inevitable. It's happening right now. And if you notice, for every month, we have a new uh, theme of the month, somewhere it's fire. Um, I was very also amused to see that uh, Siberia, one of the coldest 
cities in the world was actually having a wildfire for like a forest fire. I mean, if that is not a chance, I mean, an indication that climate change is happening. So that's, I don't know, um, we, need to, we need to open our eyes quickly. And uh, so adaptation is very important. It's not just about uh, how we perceive that we understand that, okay, climate change is happening, but we need to make lifestyle changes from an individual perspective, from a perspective from a, of a societal perspective, that what can we do as an individual, what can we do as a society to you know, adapt to changes? Maybe um, if you're trying to build a house, have better insulation spend a few extra thousand pounds, but let's have better insulation, especially this is a huge issue in uh, houses in UK, you know, where heating is a serious issue. Um, maybe wear, wear an extra level, uh, layer of clothes instead of you're turning on the heater. So small, small things. Um, that is basically how we uh, approach adaptation. And for mitigation, as uh, some experts have here already mentioned, what can be done if, if we cannot adapt to things, we have to mitigate it. So um, if, there, if, we, if we know that, okay, sea levels are rising, so we produce in more funds to the uh, coastal areas, people living in the coastal areas, maybe get them uh, um, houses on a higher ground or give them enough resources to um, tackle when there is a hurricane or when there is a tsunami, like somebody was mentioning. Uh, so, and economics, definitely. I was, I actually had a resource management as the third one, but I just felt that maybe if I just put it in the terms of economics, we can uh, understand that, you know, for whatever resources that are being given for medication purposes, that is uh, basically how much more money should be put in. If, if you say that, okay, for the, uh, con for the country of Chile, the entire coastline, we are going to upgrade it, we need like $500 million. And that is the amount of cost that is required. And the proper allocation or uh, maintenance of resources is what is very, very critical because there are many layers we have to go through. And these layers of, um, it, it has politics in it, it has legal framework, like someone was mentioning. All these factors, you know, within the planetary boundaries of economics, uh, that is, that is what is very difficult to maintain. And everybody here, I'm pretty sure, knows about the sustainable development goals, the all 17 of them. So I think it is about just um, when, when we say we are going to protect climate refugees, or when we say we're going to do something about it, we are actually going to help them out. We also need to make sure that the amount of funds we get in, uh, the amount of um, the amount of people who are ready to help, you know, on ground, because they are actually seeing. I'm sitting here and talking about this, although I do have I know so I know people because I've, I'm from the southern part of India, and although I was born and brought up in the western part, it's I've, I have always been around the coastal areas, and I have seen people actually losing their houses uh, for these things. Uh, so I have seen what is actually happening. So it's not just you know empty talks on what I've studied or what I'm going to work on or no. So when we have people there who are actually out there on ground trying to help these people, people who are losing houses, people who are, I mean, look at this picture. How do you not feel like crying? You know, so when when you talk about these things, resource management is very important. The amount of money we put in should be allocated to the right places. So um, um, I know that next our next speaker is going to be a great uh, activist from Egypt. And... I'm just glad that we have a lot of activists out there who are actually doing work, you know, not just not just coming here. I'm not going to pinpoint on activists, but not just coming out there and, you know, coming on the road, making a chaos on the streets, saying that, oh, we need this, we need that. We want actual activists who are working, who are helping these people. So me as a policymaker can sit there and be like, okay, I've seen these people work. I know these people are working. Let me put in the right policies. Let me put in policies which will actually enforce resource management and fund management. We can get a lot of foreign investment. Um, and it, that's, I, that is not a hard thing, but for that to happen, we need to actually you know, uh, have proper, proper policies in play which says that, okay, this is, this is our proposal, this is how we are going to do it. And we need uh, 20 organizations working on this thing right now. And when, when I say cost benefit analysis, we are going to also tell them we need these many million dollar, uh, dollars to you know, um, 
actually move a set of, let's say, some 20,000 um, climate refugees from Bangladesh to some other part of the world? How is that going to be beneficial for the people? How is that going to be beneficial for the country where they are moving to or for some other region where they're being moved to? It is about employment. It is about gender equality of all the 17 SDGs that should, I, I understand this sounds very ambitious that everything should go the way they are, but if we can get through even six of the SDGs, imagine the amount of impact that will have, uh, you know, on, on these refugees who are moving, who are leaving their homes, who are leaving their habitat, who have lost their families, but they also will feel that, okay, we are moving towards something better. You know, it is not just all loss. It is also about some gains, not just for them, but also for the country or the region that is accommodating these people because nobody wants extra people. You know, they already have like 100 people. Why, why should I have like 100 more people and also accommodate? So it's about, I think I, I, it's my personal feeling that we need to, uh, you know, go through all these things. So. I think that we may stop talking now. Thank you so much, Ms. Nair, for this um, very uh, insightful presentation. Thank you very much. I would have a question, but maybe let's wait the end. Let's see if we will have uh, time for, for questions. So before um, uh, giving the floor to our uh, next, next speaker, I would like also to, um, to introduce one of our youth, um, Zico. Hi. Hi again. I want to say that it was so amazing presentation for me and thank you so much. Uh, I am Siko, 19 years old from Georgia. I am system and generation volunteer in Ankara. Uh, I am studying International Plex University. My faculty is public administration and state governance. And thank you again for this presentation. <laughs> thank you very much for being with us. And uh, so we move to, to our uh, last expert, guest speaker. Uh, so Mr. Yassin, that uh, I'm very glad to, uh, to introduce because we are also, uh, we know each other. So <laughs> I'm really, really glad uh, to have you here with us to see a familiar face. So I would like to, to ask you if you, before starting your presentation, if you can also tell us a little bit more about your work. I think it would be interesting for, for our youth to know a bit better what you are doing uh, in this field. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks, uh, Jacobo. Really lovely to uh, be here again. Um, I, I won't really, uh, uh, you know, present anything. I just I want, to, sorry, I want to make sort of discussion or engaging uh, thing more than, um, uh, especially my work uh, about the climate refugees. And I will let you know um, about the last uh, updates in our work. But uh, first of all, I've um, the co-founder of Benlastic, Benlastic Egypt, uh, works more with uh, the plastic issue with the different angles because uh, people really think that it's an easy issue it's not uh, you know the, the the problem itself with um because uh, we want to say that Egypt is the first or sometimes the second ranking country producing plastic in the Mediterranean littered of course without any uh, proper waste management systems that can withstand the problem also the plastic industry is one of the most devastating uh, industries and has a uh, massive adverse impacts on uh, the, the environment and in Egypt we have more than 6000 to 7000 uh, plastic factories between the the small version to the massive versions and all of these things are really uh, uh, needs to be tackled as soon as possible and just to phase out of such uh, you know monstrous or devastating industry uh, our work is focused on uh, convincing the, uh, the people and advocating for the, for example, the shop owners, the businessmen, uh, the uh, the decision makers, everybody should change the behavior and the mindset as the plastic is the solution. It's not the perfect solution. You can find alternatives. And that comes with phases, of course. So starting with a very important thing is to reduce and then reuse 
and uh, re sorry, recycle and then reuse. And that's the three R's that we're using in our work just to make people phase out. And I really do agree. I couldn't agree more with the, uh, the honorable three speakers, especially when the uh, uh, one of the honorable speakers said that it's uh, climate activism is not just protesting in the streets or trying to uh, force people. It should uh, come with a really a good terminology or good uh, uh, like uh, what we have to say is uh, must be a dialogue, be included, because people understand what's going on. Not because uh, seems to be on the other side, uh, dictatorship or dictating people what to do, and that's what we're, what we are focusing on. Ben Lastic also one of the greatest things that now we are completing the triangle of development which is uh, government community and civil society and that's the the most important rule that we're working on on getting the three on board and nobody not uh, to be excluded from the equation and that gives us a very powerful way to to implement our activities now we've succeeded in two uh, may, uh, big uh, governors in Egypt to, to fully ban the single use plastic. We've also uh, <clears throat> managed to talk to the Minister of Environment and the Parliament to, to make a sort of a waste management law that can organize the, the massive problem of plastic in Egypt. Uh, in a way or another, um, uh, now because of the climate refugees, we've got uh, many refugees in Egypt and we are we are trying to get them on board in, in, uh, in a green economy or a circular economy, um, you know, uh, uh, like uh, industries or something related to the environment more, and even sometimes a social impact businesses now, because the it's easy now to, to have this in Egypt, even if you're not Egyptian. So those things uh, gives us a, a, a very good motivation that we can replace that economy or the, you know, what we call the linear economy with a, a better and a sustainable one with the power of refugees. But of course, not that, that's not related to the climate refugees, but I, I, I wanted to mention that because it's very important. The, uh, <clears throat> actually, so um, starting with the climate refugees problem that Egypt is uh, one of the most vulnerable countries, especially the Delta part, which is uh, in the northern uh, area of Egypt, and it's some sort of like like the Netherlands in Europe, very low land and very close to the sea, and um, it come it will drown after twenty, uh, I think twenty seventy or to twenty hundred depends on you know the climate devastation that we're doing. Also, and it's, it's mentioned by the uh, pr Prime Minister Boris Johnson, the last COP, uh, last COP, COP26, they mentioned Alexandria specifically, which is my city. And that gives me sort of, you know, alert that it's, we don't have enough actions or work to stop that devastation or that uh, deterioration to our environment with the sea level rise. And also uh, when it mentioned and translated into Arabic and into more uh, many, many more uh, or amplified through our newspaper and press, it gave the people an, a sort of alert that there is a problem and there is a climate change happening. And now it's turning to a climate crisis from the climate change to the climate crisis is really close. We don't have any time. And this gives us a, a point of view that how we can connect to the decision makers, how the language or the emotional language will change. Going now to speak to the uh, prime minister and we've uh, one of our colleagues met the prime minister. And we have spoken about the problem that's facing um, our, you know, coastal shores and uh, even in we can say on economical aspect will be a massive, massive disaster for Egypt for because we are really depending on the tourism sector, especially the beaches part and all all the year long. So it's always in Egypt as um, a, a nice weather that you can enjoy and stuff. So now you are losing everything related to your a, a vital pillar in your in your economy. So how it, this is how it goes. And uh, when I saw the presentations, it's very brilliantly uh, illustrating what is happening exactly. And the devastation will go into all people. It's not just Africa, it's not just Europe, it's everyone, even the developed countries. And I really liked when um, 
uh, Ms. Uh, Schrader said about the uh, the part of the the first alert of uh, a climate refugee came from the U.S., not from any ordinary country or undeveloped or developing country, and that uh, says that. Um, it must be a, there, there is a holistic approach or holistic a collective efforts that can be done just to stop and combat the climate change in a way or another. And uh, that gives us um, an alert also for Europe or for the developed countries. Sorry to say that, but the, just to keep uh, the borders safe, they don't have to get another climate refugees plus the owner refugees that are coming because of war. And as Dr. Sarah said, a hundred times the refugees uh, of the ordinary wars, which is massive, of course. And do you even imagine how he can do and combat uh, two uh, political issues? And uh, according to that, you will be uh, stuck in the middle of uh, complicated problems are surrounding you. So I think the perfect solution is just to act to the climate uh, change uh, uh, in a way or another. Now we've started, and that in inspired me in COP27, is to uh, tell uh, or to ask the develop developed countries, especially that we have uh, the head of states of a very, very powerful countries, mainly the G7, who uh, will be attending to Egypt in Sharm el-Sheikh, uh, that we need uh, to uh, have the funding to start uh, replacing the the uh, the dev what we call it the polluting industries because now the countries in Africa and that's the problem also facing Egypt but maybe Egypt is the least concern that we need now to after massive uh, you know wars massive civil wars uh, pandemics. Uh, epidemics, everything happened. Now Africa wants to step up and to develop the, the country. But at we have another challenge that they want to do it on the expense of the environment and the expense of the climate change. And that's the role of Egypt this, this year is to convince Africa to go for another and better solutions. But funding is important and funding, not just uh, giving a grant or funds. It, it, has, it has to depend on more reliable resources, renewable resources that can give a mutual advantage between uh, the two continents, for example, and uh, um, and I've been in a charter yesterday. Uh, the uh, started the charter in uh, <clears throat> with the Africa Foundation, uh, and uh, uh, what is really significant that they said directly that Europe must act and take a step with Africa and to be they have a sort of a partnership that they can start combating on and working for climate change and that gives me also um, uh, the opportunity to say that we need to do a sort of a treaty which must be fast to uh, or a convention that it gives us the power to use funds uh, under the uh, you know the uh, the agenda of combating climate change and uh, planning ahead of a catastrophe or a disaster that might happen because of the climate refugees so on a political level and that's what i really liked about the uh, three presentations and our two presentations that was really highlighting what are the angers that are missing. People are thinking that climate change is a sort of a luxurious thing, but it's not. And the climate refugees will be the answer of a very prolonged question. Will Are we in a climate change? Yes, of course. And that's happening. In Egypt, we can say also, we, we, we've we managed to see climate refugees because of floodings. And um, uh, mainly we have the, the biggest, or the, sorry, the tallest river in the world, which is the Nile, starting from uh, Ethiopia and, and also starting from Congo and the, the other branch and ending at the Delta in Egypt uh, back to the Mediterranean Sea. So the point here is we've seen that and even politicians say that the uh, floodings is sort of uh, they call it natural disasters, but the natural disasters is a very general term. We should rename it, and I would like to, if you can put it here or put it on social media, but we need to rename that 
it's a climate change disaster, not a natural disaster. Natural is normal, but this is not normal. This is abnormal. So we need to put that into consideration. We cannot really give uh, the, the right terminology or express uh, uh, a problem without uh, stating facts. And there are lots of missing facts in here. Um, point also uh, pointing back to my work as a also because I'm originally a solar engineer. Now Egypt have a, has a massive resource or renewable resource, which is the sun. We can say that Alexandria is maybe a little bit Mediterranean European, but the but most of the year in Egypt is sunny. So imagine one of the biggest solar power plants happening in Egypt. It can light Europe. It just if we got sort of storage for two days with a very massive sun of July, we can light your of course with a, in terms of you know the area or the area square, we can light here for two or three or even one week, uh, just because of one or six uh, sorry if twelve hours of storage of renewable energy. So that's the point is how you can collaborate. It's, we are still in Shutter Islands, and the Shutter Islands is not. It's not about you know, of course, traveling to each other, seeing each, uh, each other. Uh, post COVID, we, we we don't know what happened, but I think we've dealt globally with the, the COVID nineteen with a very maybe we can say uh, plenty. Um, we can say good. A practice, maybe more, it, it must be better because there is no justice and the vaccine, so it must be distributed all over the world. This is why the variants are existence. So we need more and more and more uh, effort, the climate change, just to stop the upcoming uh, disaster. So uh, in our, uh, you know, work or environmental scene in Egypt now, we're creating pressure groups and we're not really uh, going to uh, the way of the uh, the awareness and just offering solutions. Now we are pressuring because we have, we are approaching some uh, important, uh, you know, uh, in incidents that might happen and might affect Egypt. I want to say that the, the part that will be um, has a, a massive climate refugees and it's the Delta in Egypt because we got most of like sort of maybe 35 million Egyptians are living there. Imagine 35 million Egyptians are all over the world and Egypt is 110 million. So that's a lot. And uh, that because of the, the irresponsible actions of other countries who are developed right now without even paying the expense for it. So now we need to get back to the, the ship of the, 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 you know, what we call the global efforts. And maybe uh, we can have 60 or 70 signs of the COVID-19 problem. We need to work more and not just about the funding, but how to cooperate. You can deal with Africa as one of the greatest renewable resources. Uh, Europe can take it with a much uh, lower price that just by saving the, 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 the lots and the massive money and the greediness of the fossil fuels or the fossil fools, I can call it. And getting back to the cooperation, we need to be dependent on each other. So uh, that's my, uh, you know, uh, uh, points and and words and I'm, I'm very glad that I've, uh, I've seen the, the those presentations and really inspired me what to do next in the uh, in the COP27 and hopefully to, when we talk to the climate task force in Egypt thank you so much thanks to you dear Hamed thanks a lot uh, to, to all of you for your presentation if um, we can ask actually yeah it was very inspiring uh, also for us that you are uh, not so expert let's say but uh, uh, now we know a bit more what to do and where to to work in which direction let's say to to work forward uh, if uh, we can have um, if i can ask you just five minutes more of your time to, to our guest speakers maybe just to have a couple of questions from uh, from our youth and then we uh, we may close the the session and also we welcome uh, Rian, our dear friend. She she was following us in YouTube and she's now with us. So I don't know if um, Bura, Francesca, Noemi, Nelly, if you have any, Ezra, Paul, if you have any question for our um, panelists. Yes, actually I have a question. 
Um, maybe not a question, but more thought. Uh, Ahmed, because we were talking about the, necess the necessity to collaborate, also in terms of energy, energy sector, and energy supply between the Mediterranean area and also Egypt and maybe also North Africa and Europe. Um, my thoughts came to the Desert Tech project. Do you know the Desert Tech project? I've heard of it, yes. Uh -huh. Yes. Mm -hmm. I would like you to ask, what do you think it failed? Like, it didn't really succeed as far as I know, but it's still not totally that, but it's not going according to plan. <laughs> I think it's that that's the part of Morocco though, though because um that was there does it take between Morocco and Spain is that right? Correct me if I'm wrong. I think uh, many more countries were involved. I think it was Germany, Perfect. some European countries, in Tunisia. Also. Exactly, of course. And uh, you know, you've asked a question that we have. The only answer is that politicians, uh, politicians, and the lobbyists, the 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 don't want to uh, you know uh, add those on the agenda because they want to because getting so sorry to say but they're getting some money flowing because of the fossil fuels and the companies the biggest companies in the world um to uh keep the money flowing they doesn't care about 10 20 30 years of devastation but they just want to lobby for the you know polluting or the uh, what we call it the 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 black gold that they are claiming, but it's not black gold at all. So the the time has come is to uh, the, the politicians must listen to the um, what's happening and what is important and what is the priority because after the flooding or even what were the disasters that will happen. In Egypt, for example, because I'm, I'm really aware of what, what, what's going to happen is we will lose uh, more than 60% of our green lands because it's just the Delta and the um, Nile Valley and uh, the, the, the green parts of Egypt. The other parts are desertic. So we will lose anyway if that happened. So I think in terms of cooperation, it will be not enforced by the power of... Um, people only but will be enforced by the power of the disasters and what i see here is europe has a, a really significant chance to give uh, africa a push not just because of funding but also in terms of cooperation for you know fighting because uh, uh, they, they have the Green Deal now, fighting other, you know, massive powers who are trying to influence. But with the power of Africa, it will be way different. That's what I see. Uh, and I think what happened in Desertec, if it's not really a, a, a good success, um, uh, unfortunately, maybe it's corruption and, uh, you know, bad lobbying, or we can, can say evil lobbying to uh, such thing and never promoted very well. Thank you. Um, I will say, is there any other question? Then we may read the comment from Rian. Let me ask to our, um, to our youth. Okay, then uh, Rian, maybe do you want to, uh, to read loud your, loud your uh, comment? Okay. On the floor and uh, the mic, Uran or MN Zico, I think. Not sure if they wanted to take the mic. I don't know. Uh, it's not a question, it's uh, if you can suggest some books or some research about the topic, because I already hear. No, I mean, sorry, just speak a little bit louder or closer to okay, the mic. Sorry. Thank you. Sorry. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you so much Ryan, for the presentation. Uh, yes, uh, it's not a question. It's uh, if you can suggest some books or research about the topic, because I already hear about that in the university I study, but I really I am so interested in it. So uh, <laughs> that's all. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I feel so sorry. <laughs> Rian? That question? Yeah, sure. I, I put the comment in the chat uh, and it's not um, specifically uh, uh, tackling uh, Shrada's uh, fantastic presentation and 
all the others, I enjoyed it so much. I just noticed in the um, in the reference a very common thing about climate change uh, leading to like natural resources and uh, sorry natural disasters, um, and I think that's something that uh, should really um, maybe the youth specifically should uh, <laughs> clarify regularly that um, it's got nothing to do with nature because yes the temperature is rising and um, maybe uh, areas are being flooded but not all are being affected equally uh, the rich are able to flee are able to live on a higher mountain uh, etc so um, that really shows the extra human aspect and by um, co continuing to use the word uh, natural it's so easy to say look oh well you know it's natural can't do anything about it sorry people but if we say that natural uh, sorry disasters are not natural it should really help also the youth saying uh, that actually it's a it's a question of justice intersectional climate justice so I was um, writing if, uh, like Marius, I guess you are in touch with our guest speakers, if there are um, any research or books uh, that can be recommended, papers that, uh, uh, so that we can uh, uh, forward to, to Noemi and to, to all of us, I'd say that would be also great. Just to add on to Rian's point, you're absolutely right, Rian, because uh, uh, of course, those are references, and this is what we are here to change, you know, uh, the distinction between uh, the fine line between you know, what is considered as a natural disaster. And if I'm saying that there are more earthquakes in a certain parts of the world, it wasn't there before. It's because of the different uh, thing, changes that's happening in the world at the moment that there's so much, so much of population, there's so much of issues going on, and because of that, maybe it's, uh, I don't know how the, uh, you know, the tectonic plates are moving. Um, also, a, pro a geologist, if, if we have some geologists, uh, excuse my ignorance in this part, but I feel that, you know, these natural disasters are happening more frequently, and then we don't have a difference between what is considered as a climate disaster and what is considered as a natural disaster. So I think it's we, we need to make that difference while we are making policies, while we are trying to educate people on what is considered as, you know, a uh, difference between these disasters. It's a great, great point here. Yeah. Thanks, but also yeah. the 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 impact like if you have an earthquake in Haiti uh it has 220,000 uh, people dead if a similar happens in this it was the same year as the last big one in Haiti uh the 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 rush hour train was a couple of minutes late something i mean like massive massive difference so it's not just the earthquake itself because that would be like a hazard uh, but it's the impact so therefore very much the just this aspect of around climate refugees, uh, that it's not just like some of you also referenced like a fancy thing or a bonus thing. It's an actual material issue that, you know, the youth is going to be affected by uh, most. Yeah, absolutely. And that is why resource management, like I was mentioning, is very important because when we are putting in funds, um, we, like you said, uh, if there's a disaster in US, people will be able to figure it out, you know, they'll be like, oh yeah, let's put in some money there. But like for countries like Haiti, we need finance from foreign investments and then then it's a whole different issue because then people will bring in economies and say that, oh, I'm putting in some this much amount of money. Are these people like, uh, why should I help them? You know, so um, impact of uh, how these disasters impact and who they're impacting and how we are able to tackle these um, issues um, is, is, is what makes natural disaster different from climate disasters. I would also maybe one thing, if, if I tune the, the debate this uh, a bit more to or our or my perspective on environmental or climate migration, I think there's four points that I would like to emphasize. The first is, um, Yes, mitigation that was raised several times here. This is, of course, how, what can we do? Um, and I think the key thing is um, acknowledge the importance and relevance of people's dignity and people's rights. Um, and it's about humans. It's about the most vulnerable um, that needs protection. And I think uh, one thing, thinking in terms of migration, choice is an important thing here. Ensure the freedom of people to choose whether to migrate or not avoid displacement, avoid forced resettlement, avoid any kind of forced um, 
uh, getting people forced mobility. So give people or maximize people's um, ability to choose whether to go or to stay, not keeping them forcefully in place, but not, not making them forcefully to move. And that means mitigation is super important. Every 10th degree counts. So whatever we do to mitigate, to reduce emissions, to reduce the disastrous impacts of climate change on vulnerable people's livelihoods, and these are very, these are hugely unequally distributed, the impacts. Absolutely true. We had the devastating floods in, in Germany um, uh, in, in, uh, in this summer, um, but people are able to deal with that here. We had 160 deaths, what would be very unusually in, in, in Bangladesh because um, I think um, a disaster uh, um, preparedness in Bangladesh is higher in Germany, I think. But on the other hand, uh, did the, the ability to deal with losses is very unequal and, and rich countries uh, who caused uh, historically the vast amount of, of emissions uh, are much better able to deal uh, with, with climate change impacts because they capitalized on these emissions. So um, having caused much of emissions increases your ability to deal with the consequences of these emissions. This is the heart of climate injustice, of course. The second thing is um, adaptation is as maybe as important as, as mitigation because there is climate change happening. It will be happening regardless what we, what we do now. There will be disastrous climate change impacts. We need to adapt and we need to support people to adapt also to cover losses and damages, which was addressed on this year's COP, but still, uh, this is a huge gap, and this is a huge point of open responsibilities and uh, uh, um, a legacy of global inequalities that's that's going on and on. So this needs to be addressed. So one thing is, yeah, we can lobby it, we can advocate for addressing these inequalities. Funding is an important thing here that it burns down to to funds in in, in, in the end or very often. Um, then be prepared for climate change migration. So if people move protect them. If people need to move, if they get displaced, protect them and, and uh, ensure their rights as, as international migrants when they cross borders. Very difficult in terms of uh, refugee protection under the current rights, but there might be other ways of supporting people to ensure their rights. And if you are displaced internally, ensure their rights as well, protect them. If people decide to move because maybe not displacement, but because to support their, their places of origin, acknowledge um, that this can, this, this can happen as well. And don't discard them simply as this, these are um, um, the so-called um, uh, economic refugees. That's the debate that is very often popping up in, in rich countries. Like these are just economic migrants. So hell, if people's livelihoods are messed up due to climate change and, and climate reasons, and they decide to move to support their places of origin, yes, you can call them an economic migrants, but they, they are something like a compound economic um, global trade system injustices slash uh, climate change uh, motivated uh, migrants. Support these people, support uh, their livelihoods, acknowledge what, what they're doing. Um, that might uh, require um, preparedness in places of destinations domestically, where many people will migrate, but also internationally. So there's many things that can be done um, in terms of uh, legal frameworks, in terms of development uh, planning, in terms of uh, uh, international uh, adaptation finance in terms of uh, mitigation, but these needs to be done. And I think that's that what we can all do lobby and, and push for that. And what, what Sarah uh, pointed out, this uh, the securitization of, uh, of borders and this uh, language, this I, I find is so horrible, this, this hydrological vocabularies, right? Uh, ground swell. Even the World Bank has this terminology still there. I can't believe that they even call it the second report still ground swell. What is a ground swell? It's a mass of anonymous molecules of water that are coming and you need to put up walls and borders around that. We're talking about most vulnerable people moving. Um, so this, this should be an important thing of advocating against this kind of dehumanizing uh, perspective and, and media representations of, uh, of people, of individuals. Um, yeah. Jacob, I think uh, we are almost at the end. I wouldn't like to keep like the uh, our guest speakers to stay here longer because we asked them one hour and 15 minutes. So they, they are staying like half an hour longer, you know, and I know that there are plenty of uh, duties to do. What I would like to say, if there is like a final comment that you would like to do, so uh, everyone of you like speakers and like participants here feel free to go like for this next round of short comments please like one or maximum two minutes and then we can just wrap it up what do you think
So the floor is open for final comments if you have. I think I did my final comment already and I took uh, maybe too much time already. So, ah, oh yes, <laughs> we'll see. So, and uh, my, my last uh, words and a very important thing is to highlight um, the power of, uh, of, the, of the, you know, the youth activists and the climate activists. And now they are, we need to work and more uh, to pressure and to lobby against, you know, the uh, other uh, uh, voices that are saying, oh, we still have time. We still need to have, a um, you know, a chance to develop our countries in a way that is devastating to the environment but the solution is out there the the technology is out there scientists are really working in a very a brilliant way and massive way that just to uh, alternate and to have a better solutions for a better future so uh, believe in science and believe in facts we can do this and we can we have an actions that can work and to, to be implemented on the solid ground for a better future and hopefully i see you all at the cop 27 We're waiting for your invitation, Ahmed. <laughs> yeah, I would like to say that to, to invite us. Uh, I don't think we're all still out of the uh, effects of COP26 at the moment. Uh, I was here on, on ground look, watching all these things and I'm like, oh my God, I need a break before I get to COP26. Uh, sorry, COP27. Um, so I'll not take up a lot of time. Um, to all the youth present here today and to everybody else who you know, you know, um, um, I would just like to say, uh, being a youth, I am on a path where you can either take two, two roads, either you become a front-end climate activist, which I think Ahmed is one of them. And thank you so much for what you're doing, Ahmed. Great job. And, um, or someone like me, who's trying to be a back-end climate activist, you know, take the economics and policy route and, you know, go re try to reach to a position where you can, you make policies, make some, make changes and uh, have a transit con connection between both these communities of youth. You know, that is what I would request everyone create and, and improve your network and have a strong connection between both these, uh, 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 what do you say, youth groups where one is out there helping people and seeing the actual world and coming back and telling them, listen, this is what's going wrong. Uh, the people before you have not really had great policies, uh, but you do have a chance to make a difference. So this is what is happening. Make some difference. So here, then, you know, these people will be like, yeah, okay, we can, we can try to put in some efforts. So we also need more people to not just be out there. We also need people back here to, you know, back us up and say, okay, hey, I'm going to do the cost benefit analysis. I'm going to do uh, the um, impacts of environment, impacts on environment, impacts on economics, everything. And this is our uh, draft right now. Make a policy, design a policy. Let that also um, affect these climate refugees in a very positive way. So, you know, we need, we need both the worlds to be very, very strongly connected and not be blindsided by what's happening. And that's, that's something very important. I think that's, that's what I have to say. Yeah, I don't want to take away from any of those sentiments. I think um, lots of what we need to do um, and, and, and moves we can make to start these things in motion have been said. Um, I just want to say, you know, use us, right? Use people who've studied policy processes, who've charted these processes for long enough that we're probably no longer quite youth um, and who are, who are in these negotiations and you know reach out to us if, if we can be helpful to you um, we're often looking for those connections as well um, you know if you want to read publications that are behind a paywall like send us an email you know please do um, keep those connections going to us as well and we're you know I was really glad to be here today and um, yeah please reach out if that can be useful in the future. All right, I guess we can close. I would like to, uh, to thank for these uh, messages uh, of hope that uh, you share with us. Um, from my side, I wanted to say like before uh, this, uh, this session actually was pretty much um, pessimistic, uh, let's say, because uh, reading uh, 
the, the outcomes of the COP26 in Glasgow. Uh, it was pretty um, worrying the fact that, for example, as we see, as we have seen also in, in the presentation, countries like uh, China, that they produce uh, the most of um, fuel fossil. Uh, actually, they don't have any any real plan. Like they they take uh, the the commitment, but without any uh, clear plan, without any real detail on how to reduce this fuel fossil in the in the next ten years, in the next future. And uh, the same also I, I've seen um, I've read um, for Indonesia. Like first they took the commitment, but then they stepped backwards because they say it's too much still too much important for their economy to use this kind of fuel fossil. Uh, so let's say I found it very, uh, these days reading uh, uh, these news were really, uh, I don't know how to say, it, put me a lot of uh, uh, anxiety. But I think today we, we heard some really hopeful messages on how uh, we can from our side, not just wait uh, uh, governments to act, but also we can do a lot in the meantime. Uh, take responsibility, shape uh, uh, policies at, at the local level. And um, I, I'm glad that uh, at least I would say many uh, civil society organizations now they put in the agenda, the, the climate change in their agenda. At least uh, we speak much more than, than in the past, I will say. So it's something that uh, we should uh, keep doing. And also, um, I will say, keep uh, working for the humanitarization of the refugees, as uh, it was mentioned before by uh, Dr. Sterling. So to see uh, refugees as, as people, first of all, and um, and to, to empathize this. I mean, um, no matter if they are coming from economic reasons, social reasons for natural disasters, for, um, for climate change, but uh, uh, also there is a lot, I would say, to work in this uh, process of humanitarization. So being able to see them as, as our uh, brothers and sisters uh, that we need to, to help. Uh, thank you very much from my side. I really am so grateful to our uh, experts and to all the participants. I don't know if Marius, if you have any last words. I was just reading a comment. Uh, but uh, I don't have time to uh, to answer it now. So Jacopo, you more or less covered covered everything. So I'm just glad and happy. First of all, thank you very much for accepting the invitation to to all of you. Your insights were really powerful and were so technical. So we'll take some notes uh, about that and we'll we'll use them for the for the handbook. So thank you very much and uh, please keep your keep an eye on your email because when once we are done with the uh, with the handbook, we'll, we'll share it with you. So you can make also some comments and uh, you can, uh, that, that can be helpful also for us for to improve for the for the future. As this is the first project that we're doing together uh, with uh, with the organization of Jacopo in Ankara. So also, it was also our first time on doing something like coordinating together and we got also to know each other. So thank you very much to everyone. Thank you very much to the speakers. Thank you very much for the participants that were here. And uh, thank you very much also to the members of both organizations that were and that were here. Hope to see your great achievements <laughs> in, the, in the future. And uh, as I mentioned before, if you want to read something about this, you have like, um, you, you have research academics from uh, Dr. Sterling and Dr. Nash. So just search from, from, for them. In, uh, in Google and you'll find a lot of papers. So thank you very much again to everyone. And I just would like to close it here. So goodbye. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Goodbye. Have a good evening. Bye-bye. Thank Thanks a lot. Good night.